there's one thing I always meant to ask Jack. Back in the old days, I wanted to know about that doctor of his. The man who appears out of nowhere and saves the world, except sometimes he doesn't. All those times in history when there was no sign of him, I wanted to know why not. But I don't need to ask anymore. I know the answer now. Sometimes the doctor must look at this planet and turn away in shame. I have a distinct memory of this series being very, very disturbing. I was just striking puberty when this series came out, so can't be as bad watching it now as an adult, right? <laughs> It's not just disturbing in substance, it juggles some really heavy-handed themes, particularly how the human race would respond to an extraterrestrial crisis within the backdrop of the first Davies era Hooniverse. Originally, Russell T Davies held the title of the creator of Torchwood, only being responsible for writing the pilot episode Everything Changes. For series three, however, everything changed. It is marked as being unique for Davies taking the driver's seat and being the writer of three out of five episodes in this series. The contrast between Children of Earth and the bloated two series that preceded it is absolutely night and day. It's not perfect, but it has some absolutely outstanding moments. And that's what I aim to do today, highlight why exactly this series has the reputation it does, whilst poking a few holes in it to give it the full assessment it deserves. We can start with the fact that this series is continuous and not anthological. Series 1 and 2 took the concept of Doctor Who for adults very literally, with a considerable amount of episodes being duds or outright embarrassments. The trouble was that when Torchwood was good, it was really good. Condensing Children of Earth down to five episodes, each an hour in length, gives every scene purpose without any time to waste. Not only that, but Davies managed to secure the series daily releases on Monday to Friday evenings on BBC One in July 2009. This was considered to be a dead time for TV viewers, yet despite that, Torchwood broke its own records, with episode four reaching nearly seven million million people. Perhaps inspired by the American TV show 24, the story itself surrounds the events of five days, giving the series a sense of pseudo-realism to keep audiences returning to their TV screens every night. In the spirit of nostalgia and reliving that one-time televisual experience, I will be making my reviews of each episode of Children of Earth public Monday to Friday at 7pm UTC. If you simply cannot wait that long or want to support what I do on YouTube, you can head over to my Patreon page where you are welcome to join my early access crew. There you will be able to watch my complete review of Torchwood Children of Earth before everybody else. The first Children of Earth episode is simply titled Day One, not to be confused with the episode in Series One named Day One as well. You know, the one with the sex monster. Let's start with the snappy title sequence. The concise and calmly foreboding simplicity is a welcome change that entices the audience to find out what each episode has in store. I will say that on the whole, the score feels a lot more catered to a singular theme or idea than just generic sci-fi drama music. Despite Ben Foster writing the music for this series and those prior, I find the music in this series to be far more urgent, chilling and memorable. The prologue scene set in 1965, for example, contains a truly haunting piece of music to keep this event firmly placed in the back of our minds as the series progresses. We don't know at this point that the children on the school bus were orphans and no words are spoken aside from the muffled excitement of the children. By contrast, the children of the 21st century are seen as irritations playing up during the daily school run. It toys with the idea that despite the orphans having nobody paying attention 
attention to them, the same can be said for even those that are lucky enough to have parents. I appreciated the way the episode waved a red herring in front of us with this Dr. Patanjali character. What was your name again? Rupesh. Rupesh Patanjali. He's annoying as all hell, and his dialogue comes off as very clunky and clumsily written. You're Torchwood! Never heard of him! There are bodies going missing! This whole city talks about you. Little did we know, however, that this was all a ruse for his true intentions as a secret agent working for John Frobisher's assassin named Johnson. No joke. This is this female character's given name. For a character with no identity to distinguish her, such an unassuming name is definitely fitting. Meanwhile, we see that Peter Capaldi reprises his role as a high-ranking civil servant. I'm helping out Miss Spears while they introduce a new computer system. You fuck off, darling. I appreciate Peter Capaldi so much for his portrayal of the character John Frobisher in this series, mainly for him being the complete opposite of Malcolm Tucker from The Thick of It. Frobisher is a softer individual who has a family and can't seem to stand up for himself when pitted against a slimy character like the Prime Minister in this show, Brian Green. I wonder if he was related to the late Joseph Green. I need to be naked. The sins of the past are being lumped onto Frobisher. Also that the PM can avoid blowback when the truth that a few Scottish children were sacrificed to save millions comes to light. They characterise Frobisher as the middleman really well, establishing the idea of responsibility and middlemen as a recurring theme for the series. Then onto something really wacky, the children screaming in unison. Some of the children's faces are so fantastic that I couldn't resist putting two of them in this video's thumbnail. It's all really uncanny. To have the most innocent and well-protected elements of our society being manipulated in this way sends shivers down my spine. We need a child, because we need to test those frequencies. Find the right frequency and we can find out who's transmitting. You get a child, though. If there was a means of holding the world hostage, taking control of the future generations of humanity would definitely be the way to do it. The most disturbing thing is that this hasn't always been the way of things. Looking back to the Victorian period, where children were sweeping chimneys and treated as though they should be seen and not heard, shows just how little value they had until very recently in the story of humanity. It's a shame that this wasn't examined further by the series. Had perhaps the flashback to 1960 been set even further back in time, justifying the sacrifice of human children may have been disturbingly easier for the adults of the day. The expert on the 456 is a character called Mr. Decker, who, aside from this moment, does not live up to his potential as a mad scientist character. They prop him up as a big deal with his visits to Frobisher, succeeding even Torchwood in priority. Sadly, this character doesn't receive a terrific amount of payoff. The final episode shows him merely becoming a punching bag for soldiers. Here, what are you doing? I've analysed those transmissions for 40 years and never broke them. Without much reason for doing so. The only connection he has with the 456 is that he has 40 years experience translating their messages. Still. It was a better role for Ian Gelder than what they gave him in series 12 of Doctor Who. The episode also establishes characters with children that are related to the two male members of Torchwood. Gwen is also tied to the child problem by being made pregnant for the second time in the show. They sadly neglected to reference her rather insane wedding episode, but this idea is still alluded to for great dramatic effect in episode 5. You want to have kids in a world like this, Rhys? You're not getting rid of it. Is that right? Though I believe it to be for reasons found in this series, not prior ones. Anyway, let's start with possibly my favourite new family introduced to the show, Ianto's sister Rhiannon and her husband Johnny. Clearly Ianto didn't visit very often, but that doesn't stop his sister from welcoming him in with open arms. Johnny and Rhiannon share hilarious working class characteristics, their thirst for gossip, flagrant homophobia. Have you gone bender? Misha's hearing this. She's not bothered. Her friend Shan's got two mothers. And granted, it might make for less than rootable characters on the surface, except that these chinks in the armor are crushed by the boot of love. It's weird. It's not men, it's just him. 
It's only him. Just as this scene was reaching heights of excellence, it pushes the boundary into perfection land. Black thing. Oh, that's the that's the company car. You want to watch it on this estate, but that was fine. Top of the range, it's got a triple deadlock. When Ianto's car gets stolen by people on the estate. <laughs> He's got a triple deadlock, he can't have. The absolute insanity that ensued had me in stitches. Mooning out of the window, Johnny throwing bricks as a matter of ritual. Alien monsters great and small have utilized this technology to their benefit, yet a bunch of kids on the estate were able to break it no problem. Fuck, man, that was a... 10 out of 10 moment right there. The other family of focus in this mini-series is that of Jack's daughter and grandson named Alice and Steve, respectively. It's astounding to me that neither family was mentioned in prior series, yet at the same time, the fact both are painted as being a little standoffish compensates for this. Jack and Alice's relationship especially sets up this idea of him being this absent father figure that just sends her money and visits once in a blue moon just to make sure they're both cushy. Alice's mother being a torturer agent back in the day with Alice knowing all about Jack's immortality antics means she probably blames Jack for being brought into the world, resenting a father that will potentially outlive her and her son. The truth that Grandad doesn't age is too bizarre and strange to be revealed to Steve, so it works in everybody's favour if Uncle Jack doesn't visit very often. Gwen is then sent on a side quest to find the only adult that is being controlled like the children are. Tim. Or Clem. Pick your poison. He's a creepy dude. No such thing. <laughs> this tick of his would later be revealed to us as the final words Clem would say to Jack Harkness before nearly being delivered to the 456 in 1965. Apparently the aliens were picky about Clem though. It's too old. With different children entering puberty at different times in their lives, thankfully this distinction of acceptable sacrifice to the 456 isn't something the series gets particularly bogged down in. Right after that, Gwen heads back to the Torchwood base. Ianto mysteriously is already there. I lost the car. Yeah, and if you find anything, let me know straight away. Don't wait for me to get back. These kids are nicked in. Yeah, see you later. And I loved seeing her on autopilot, not really caring about what Ianto is telling her as the prospect of her pregnancy is completely overwhelming her ability to listen to him. I think the most praiseworthy aspect of this episode are the mysteries that it sets out to serve us over the course of a five episode meal. What the hell is the 456? Who are the other people on John Frobisher's hit list? What exactly is the government hiding? Why are a bunch of children screaming and expressing their need to go to the bathroom? However, there was one thing I wasn't too happy about. The new girl who works for John Frobisher, Lois Abiba. She was able to discern from her supervisor sending an aggravated email that it was worth investigating said supervisor's emails on her first day on the job. And that would rain down upon you so hard. You'd have to be reassembled by fucking air crash investigators. However, you've got to love a Davies style cliffhanger. You know, the ones that highlight all the major players in the story, reacting to multiple disasters happening simultaneously. This first episode was pure hype of the highest quality. Great characters, great setup. If this episode is the hors d'oeuvre, the main course is going to be something that is going to knock our socks off. I give day one. A 9 out of 10.